a case for music and singing in four parts, and only four parts, because to quote a seminary professor of mine, no one hears a word you say after the one hour mark. <laughs> In the sixth century before the Common Era, ancient Greek followers of Pythagoras had the marriage between music and mathematics figured out. Musical harmonies, as far as these thinkers were concerned, was governed by the same numerical proportions as the rest of the natural world. The planets, as far as they were seeing them, were spinning in synchronized ratios according to their speeds and their distances from the Earth. They found these similar ratios that were present in the musical scale, do, re, mi, fa, so, etc., which exemplified a central truth about the universe as they knew it. This was a music of the spheres. Some of our oldest documented histories reflect the idea that music, sound, and vibration was a natural occurrence, reflecting some sort of a purpose-filled intelligent system that might even embody some sort of universal wisdom. These are thinkers who knew that vibration was everything, be it an oboe reed, a piano string, a vocal cord, or two fingers snapping. We make sounds, and by extension, we make music because we cannot help ourselves. We're no more aware of this than we subject ourselves to silence. Our silent meditations on Sunday morning only last about 45 seconds. Would you believe it's only 45 seconds? <laughs> but in that brief moment, when we defy our body's inherent need to fidget, to cross our legs, to fix our hair, to check our phone, it's almost as if we're defying nature in our quest to breathe in peace and breathe out love. Singing and chanting is generated deep within the human body and resonates in really all parts of our anatomy as it passes to the external world. The chest, pharynx, throat, and nasal passages are all engaged. And to make the freest, most natural sounds, we first have to remove the tension that's found in our tongue, in our hips, even sometimes in the arches of our feet, not to mention the tension that we bring from our work, from our routines, or from our own culture's glorification of busy. That's why I start every choir rehearsal and every warm up with a hum. To make music in community is to free our bodies, if only for a bit, of the individual races we're running. Music has the power to change human behavior, and history has used this fact both as justifications for and against. American singer Bernice Johnson Reagan says it well, songs are a way to get singing. No kidding. <laughs> the singing is what you are aiming for, and the singing is running the sound through your body. You cannot sing a song and not change your condition. You cannot sing a song and not change your condition. Here in this space, that change of condition happens when we begin worship with a song, when we sing the Spirit Jam participants out, when we sing in response to the lighting of our chalice, or when we come out of silent meditation with a chant. Participating and sharing in the making of the community song helps us to mark time during this set-aside hour and helps us to mark time the whole year round. It's why we have different songs for departing and arriving, rejoicing and lamenting, Christmas or solstice, and water or flower communion, protesting publicly and personal piousness. Music defines who we are. When I first visited this congregation on Easter Sunday two years ago, I knew very little about Unitarian Universalism. And when I arrived here, through the wrong door, by the way, <laughs> rather than seeking out the literature in the hallway that I knew was probably tailored just for people like me, I turned to one of my old contextual tricks for learning about a place such as this. I sat down right where uh, David and Sally are right now, and I reached for a gray hymnal the first piece of literature that I knew would tell me exactly what this place is about.
Here's what I saw. I saw hymns and songs with texts that had been updated to transcend the male-female binary and a degendering of God and other deities that was far ahead of its time. I saw songs that were meant to be sung in unison, sung in rounds, some in four-part harmony, sometimes all together, sometimes with a leader and a follower. I saw some songs that could be accompanied with a band, a piano, maybe even an organ, or nothing but the naked voice. I saw many tunes that I knew well, many of them borrowed from Christian traditions. And I saw new tunes written by UUs and for UUs. I also saw some beautiful texts that seemed to me were just paired with the wrong tune. <laughs> some hymns are square pegs in round holes. Perhaps you felt that we've sung a few of those. And perhaps it's as if someone had decided, let's cast the net just a bit wider. But this new idea somehow has to reconcile what's already here in some form. I saw that this hymnal does a pretty good job of identifying its sources, provided that source is European. All of the hymns from African-American sources in this hymnal label the same on the bottom right, African-American spiritual, 1750 to 1875. And I thought to myself, perhaps they're working on this. <laughs> and we are. These old, old books with creased pages, alterations to make sure we remember to answer the call rather than stand by the side of love, Bindings worn to our favorite stopping places sure tell us a lot about who we are and who we could be. The voice brings music into a space full of potential. Seek that essence. Hold that essence. Let that essence carry you as we all seek to find true harmony.